Pastor Jeff's going to preach this morning, but Josh here is one of our own fellows. He went to Bible college, and he's headed off, and we're going to get behind him. We're going to revitalize the church down in southern Iowa, Leon, Iowa. I, it's a hillbilly area, uh, but hillbillies need Jesus too. I think we got the perfect pastor right here for them. <laughs> Actually, he's hardworking. He loves everybody, and we're going we're gonna to reach a lot of people together. And uh, you all clapping for Josh, huh? He's awesome, and uh, he really is. I pray that the, uh, the God will send him a woman that doesn't have a great physical eyesight so he can get married <laughs> and uh, be a partner in ministry. And uh, we want to, uh, we, we want to uh, send him off. We're going to get behind him, whatever that place needs, revitalize that place, the physical structure, make the yard shine like the top of the Chrysler building and make it just beautiful, the building needs paint or whatever it needs, we're going to come behind them, help them get money to reach to the counties around there. It's, it's, this is a church that has potential to be uh, uh, explosive. And uh, Josh has a great heart. He's a humble man. He's worked hard. He works hard. He'll love people like nobody. He's not just a preacher man. He's a pastor. So let's pray for him right now because we're going to send him out his first Sundays next week. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. You be with Josh, send him forth in your power, God of your spirit, and raise up a mighty work there. May people come to know you, Jesus. Bless him and give him wisdom beyond his years, God, and strengthen him for the task ahead. I know you're going to, Father. We're proud of him, and uh, we've been so blessed by his ministry among us, and now we send him forward in the name of Jesus and your Holy Spirit. Go with him. And everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Give him a big hand. Let him know you're going to be behind him. He's a good-looking boy, isn't he? Uh, and th some of you girls looking for a man, just call me up. I'll give you his number, and uh, he, he's, he's, he needs a little help. Pastor Jeff, it's good to have you here. I don't know of any other place where a pastor's been in a place 20 years, and then the people vote if he's going to be senior pastor, and he gets 99% of the vote. Now, where does that happen? Right here. Because he's real, and people know him, and he's a humble servant, and... Uh, I, 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 I'm, I was a little surprised myself, but I'm really happy for you. And I'm sorry I didn't vote for you, but <laughs> you would have got 100%. You know, you know what I'm really surprised what? at? How, how great those lessons that you gave Benita about the monkey sounds. Oh, yeah. She did good. She, that <laughs> was a good, so, the best solo I ever heard. <laughs> but I'm not talking about Benita right all now. The, all the monkey sounds you do in the office all the time? I'm, I'm good at that. Yeah. But one thing, one thing I do want to say is, is that that I, I do want to say this all in my heart is that, you know, as I grow older, I realize that, you know, when you have a father that dies about the age that I do, you, you know, you don't want to, you don't, you don't know about tomorrow. I'm not sick. I'm not announcing anything. I'm just saying, but it's good to know because this church was never meant to be about a person, but it's good to know we have many good pastors and that pastor Jeff is a, a is, is a qualified leader, a humble servant and things aren't about him. And I appreciate him, and I want you to let him know you appreciate him. And in fact, when I go out of town, I don't worry about things anymore. I used to when you were younger, because I knew you could do something stupid. <laughs> I did too. I don't don't worry about that anymore. <laughs> Let's welcome Pastor Jeff to the pulpit. Oh. Thank you. Well, I'm honored to be able to uh, bring the message to you today as I'm thinking back um, to when we came to New Hope. It was actually 20 years this Sunday. It was the fourth Sunday of October was our very first Sunday. So 20 years ago this Sunday was our, uh, our first Sunday here at New Hope. So I never, I never dreamed it would be 20 years later. I didn't think I'd live 20 years later. I didn't think, I thought the Lord would come back by now, and, uh, but here we are. So we'll come back tonight to find out when the Lord is coming. Do you, do you have that figured out? Oh, did you say that? I, I, timeline of events. That, that's good. Because I said that we can't know the day or the hour. That's what, that's what Jesus said. Yeah. That's how we started off that series. And I was hoping we, yeah. Y'all are much more alive and awake than the early service. We, we had to, I was thinking about doing calisthenics or something to get everybody started, but hey, we are in a series, uh, continuing on a series that we've entitled Jesus Is, and uh, this is the fifth in that series. 
Last week, Pastor Brian uh, preached out of this chapter, John chapter 10, so I want you to turn to John chapter 10. We're going to go back through some of what he covered last week and go on a few verses. He talked last week about how Jesus is the door, and um, today we look at Jesus, the good shepherd. So John chapter 10, we're going to go back and start with verse 1, and we'll read through verse 15. Jesus' words, he said, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life, life abundantly. I am a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me, just as my father knows me and I know my father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. So this morning we're talking about sheep and shepherds. And if you've been to Israel, uh, I know many of you have, uh, sheep and shepherds are a large part of the Mediterranean world. It was so in the biblical times, and if you go there today, you'll still see out on the hillsides modern-day shepherds uh, with flocks of sheep. And so in Jesus' time, in biblical times, um, this, or as we read in the Bible, it was a, a common theme. We're always hearing about shepherds, and we're hearing about sheep. Abraham was a shepherd. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph and his brothers were shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. David and his brothers, sons of Jesse, were shepherds. Um, There's a whole lot of other people as we read through the Bible who we know that they had a hand in caring for sheep. Now, David is the one who said, um, the Lord is my shepherd. Okay? Sheep, we know, are... um, belong to shepherds. Shepherds care for sheep. Sheep were an important uh, resource. They were a source of food. They were often used for sacrifices. Sheep skins were used to hold liquids like water or wine, uh, also used for clothing, for coverings, parchment to write on. The sheep bones were made as uh, writing utensils. So everywhere you look, you see sheep. Sheep are everywhere. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. And I wonder if he could have come up with a better metaphor. Because if the Lord is his shepherd, and if we would say the Lord is our shepherd, what does that make us? Sheep. Any of you spent much time with sheep? Maybe at the fair. We're all city folk here, right? Most of us. Haven't spent much time with sheep unless we've been at the at the fair, and I can tell you it's a smelly barn where the sheep are. But if the Lord is our shepherd, that makes us sheep, and sheep are pretty dumb. I heard someone say stupid. That's that's a pretty strong word. But sheep are not known to be the wisest, most um, um, smart animals. And so you think that David could have come up with something a little bit better, but the truth is uh, we have a lot more things in common with sheep than we really would want to admit. 
Sheep are pretty helpless. Of all the animals, sheep are the least likely to be able to take care of themselves. And I want you to think about this. Sheep, uh, you go to a circus, and you can see um, lion tamers. You can see people who've trained elephants, people who train monkeys. I mean, all these animals that do different things. Sheep, no sheep trainers. Sheep, sheep don't do tricks. Sheep pretty much just wander around. I don't know, you, somebody got, a, got, a, got something good to say about sheep? They have wool, that's, that's good. Sheep are pretty helpless. Um, sheep occasionally wander off, and it's not just uh, wandering uh, off occasionally, it's a, way, it's a way of life for them. Sheep love to eat, and the way they do that, they just put their head down, and they may stay with their head down for hours, and they're just following the next piece of grass, and next thing you know, they end up somewhere where they have no idea where they're at. They're lost, the lost sheep. Wandering off is what we would expect from a sheep. There's a lot of lyrics from some of the songs that we sing out of our hymn book talking about, you know, how we're prone like a sheep to wander. That's us. Here's another comparison. Sheep are uh, very obstinate, known to be obstinate. Any of you know anyone that's obstinate? Uh, we humans, we, we like to do things our way. Um, forget the easy way. Forget the, the common way. Forget doing things the best way. Forget doing things God's way. We're going to do it. I'm going to do it my way. You live with some people that like doing it that way. A lot of younger, younger people in your home, that's the way they like to do things. Sheep can be obstinate. Uh, Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all have wandered away like sheep. Each of us has gone our own way. I read a story this week about uh, an incident that happened just this year, July 12th, in the country of Turkey, and uh, there was a shepherd out with his sheep, and uh, he had one sheep in his, in his, um, in his flock that decided he was going to jump over a cliff. Suicide sheep, I guess. I don't know what was going on there, but one sheep went over the cliff, and what do you think happened with the rest of the sheep? They follow. One by one, the sheep just walked up to see. I don't know if he was just looking to see what the other one did, but he jumped over, and it was like he, so he went into a mad rush trying to save his sheep. All total, he lost 80 sheep that went over the cliff. He was able to keep just a few for himself, but that's what sheep do. There's another story, and you can read about it. 2005 was an incident in Turkey again. I don't know what it is with their, their possessed sheep in Turkey, but that day, 1,500, several flocks of sheep together, 1,500 sheep over the edge, one by one. They only lost 400 because after a few hundred of them jumped over, the pile just got bigger and bigger and it <laughs> softer, and so the ones that were jumping over just landed on the rest of them. And so all in all, the losses were pretty minimal, but uh, this, is, this is sheep. And I wish there was a better illustration that we could compare ourselves to, but uh, Jesus said it, David said it, I guess we, we have the label and that's us. We're, we're, just like, we're just like sheep. But as we talk about sheep, I think the thing that we need to talk about today and what Jesus was talking about is shepherds. If we're sheep, we need, we need shepherds. In the time of Jesus, uh, as Jesus was uh, living, living his life here and what we were reading um, Shepherds were definitely part of the culture, but shepherds were not uh, the, uh, the, the highest ranking in society. Shepherds were poor people. Uh, a word that would describe them would be despicable. They were dirty. 
treated as outcasts. They were nobodies. They were undesirables in the society. Uh, And so these people that were listening to Jesus talking about sheep and shepherds immediately knew uh, what he meant as he was talking about sheep and shepherds. Just like if I were to talk about politicians today, we all would have some idea in our mind what we think of politicians or or lawyers or uh, a kindergarten teacher. You've got some kind of an idea in your mind of who I'm talking about and some of the characteristics and qualities, uh, the images that come with those kind of people. It's interesting that God chose these lowly, lowly people in society, shepherds, were the first ones that saw the light in the sky when Jesus was born. It, were shep- it was shepherds that he first announced the birth of the Messiah. You remember out in the field, a heavenly host, and they spoke to the shepherds. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God chose the foolish things, things that are powerless, things despised by the world, counted as nothing at all to despise the wise. God chose the lowly things. And so he uses this metaphor of a sheep and a shepherd in reference to himself and his people. We're his sheep, and he's the shepherd. From the Old Testament through the New Testament, there were times in the New Testament where it's recorded that Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion on them because they were like, a, like, like sheep without a shepherd. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd the guardian of your souls. So as Jesus was talking about shepherds to this crowd uh, in this day, here's what would have come to their mind, things that they remember, things that they know. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. David said in Psalm 100, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. In Ezekiel's recorded, God said, I will bring them back home to their own land of Israel from among the peoples and the nations. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and by the rivers and in all the places where people live. Yes, I will give them good pasture land on the high hills of Israel. There they will lie down in pleasant places and feed in the lush pastures of the hills. I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lie down in peace, says the sovereign Lord. God says, I will be your shepherd, me, Me and me alone, I will be the shepherd of your soul. Twice in the passage of Scripture that I read this morning in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the the good shepherd. Jesus is the fulfillment of all these shepherd texts. He's God in the flesh. He came to gather his people, to shepherd them for all of eternity. He said, I am the, the good shepherd. The word good describes something ideal, the model for everything else that would follow. So to call Jesus good or the good shepherd is really to call him God. You remember the story um, of, the, of the rich ruler? And he came to Jesus, and this is what he said. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what was Jesus' response? Why do you call me good? Only God is good. And so what Jesus is saying to him, who you're talking to, you're talking to God himself. And so when he says he's the good shepherd, we know that he's, that he's God himself. So what is it that makes Jesus the good shepherd? Or what marks him as the good shepherd? Today I want us to look uh, at three things that mark him as good shepherd. And the first one is this, that he knows his sheep. He said the good shepherd knows his sheep. John 10, 3, he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So last week, Pastor Brian 
talked on this passage of Scripture talking about Jesus, the door or the gate to the, to the sheep fold or the sheep pen. And so he explained to us how, you know, a lot of different flocks of sheep, the sheep herders would come together, and they would together uh, put their sheep in the, in the pen or the sheep fold. And there might be several flocks of sheep together, all with different shepherds, but they would come in here and they would spend the night, and there isn't one opening, it's a tall enough wall that they can't jump out, and then it would be hard for someone to come in to steal them. And the uh, shepherd, he said, would be the gate. And Jesus said, I am, I am the gate, or I am the door. And so the shepherd would stay right in that gate to keep the sheep from coming, from leaving the sheep pen, keeping the intruders out and keeping the sheep in. I realized last week when Pastor Brian was talking about Jesus being the door or being the gate and this whole idea right here, I learned this principle as a very young youth pastor uh, 30, 30 years ago. Um, I was, uh, I was real young in ministry, and our very first year, we, um, we, I took a group of kids to a youth convention, and there was this one kid in my youth group, his name was Ira, Ira Gibson. Um, this is the kid that when um, I went to interview, we got on a bus and we went to a hot springs and we, we went swimming. This is my first introduction to this group of kids. I'm still in college. I don't know what I'm doing. I, you know, my first impression was this. Ira sat in the back of the bus and he took a lighter and he got lighter fluid all over his hand and he showed me that he could light his hand on fire. He was like, see, look at this, look how cool this is. And I'm going, this, this isn't cool. <laughs> This kid's scaring me. But this is, the kind of, this is the kind of kid he was, just always practical, joking, doing different things. So youth convention, uh, we're going to Great Falls, and, and uh, this is where Ira had moved to our town from. And so he was excited to connect with some of his friends in Great Falls, and he had t- told these stories about how he was going to leave that night and leave the hotel room. And I'm thinking, the last thing I'm going to do is let this kid leave the hotel room. And so guess where I slept? I learned that I could be a gatekeeper. I took my sleeping bag and my pillow, and I slept right by the door. And I'm thinking, there's no way he's going out without me knowing. So he's either going to, I don't know what he can do to me, but he's going to have a fight on his hands. Um, it reminded me of another story. Uh, it was my first year to go to camp, and uh, I went to senior high camp. I took two, there were two guys that went with me to camp, one kid named Jason Harrison, who was in our group, and he brought a friend named Matt Sy. And uh, Jeannie knows who I'm talking about. Je- this, this, this kid, he was, he was another, wild, I had a lot of wild children in my youth group. And um, so they were talking about how they were going to get out that night, and the, I, I'd heard rumors of what they were going to do to me. I don't know if you've ever been to camp as a counselor or anything like this, but, uh, you know, I'm new at all this, and uh, these kids are as big as me or bigger than me, and uh, it was just the, just the two guys and me in this room, and so I decided I'm going to outlast these guys, and uh, I'm not going to sleep until they go to sleep. And so about the third night, I've had about four hours of sleep this, this whole week trying to outlast these guys, and I knew I was, I'm wearing down, and I'm getting pretty weak, and I'm getting pretty tired. And I heard things about toothpaste and shaving cream and warm water and different things like this. And, um, and so I, I was bound to determine that they're not going to get me. So, but I'm super, super tired. And I'm laying on my bed and I'm hearing them talk. And I'm thinking, Lord, you've got to help me because I am, I am ready just to go to sleep. I am cashing in. And whatever happens, it's just. <laughs> and so um, I realized that I had dozed off. And as soon as I, my, my eyes popped open and those guys were like right here in my face <laughs> with a tube of toothpaste. And Jason hits Matt and he goes, see, I told you he was awake. And I'm thinking, yes, Lord. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Some uh, crazy stories. I, I can't tell any stories like that here at New Hope. These guys were just perfect. Where's Jared? Um, good, good, good memories. Where was I at? <laughs> I got distracted about that gate thing. You guys know where I was at? <laughs> so, 
So Pastor Brian had mentioned about the gate and that the, that the sheep were all in there together. And, you know, you would wonder, how do these sheep get out of here because now everybody's got their sheep together? Well, the, the thing that we read in the Scripture and that we know is that sheep learn the, the, the voice of their shepherd. And so in the morning as they take their sheep out, all they had to do was a whistle or a word or something like that, and those sheep are going to follow their shepherd. They're not following a strange voice. They're only going to follow the voice that they know. And so all he has to do is say the word or, or some kind of a sound, and those sheep will respond to him. And he, he knows his sheep. His sheep know him. They know his voice, and, and, and they go out. Ezekiel chapter 34, the Lord says, uh, who is the great shepherd? He says, I, my sh- I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. The, the idea here is that he knows his sheep. He knows them well. He knows their condition. He knows that they're lost. He knows that they are prone to stray. He knows that they're injured or when they're weak and he's able to give the proper care. He knows which sheep it is that is prone to wander and he's gonna keep his eyes on that sheep. He knows which sheep is, is sluggish, and so he, he, he knows that he needs to prod this one. He knows the ones that are weaker, and he treats them a little bit more gently. You see, the better a, a shepherd knows his sheep, the better he can care for them. And here's what I want to tell you today that you need to know, and you've heard this, but you need to let it sink in. Jesus knows you. He knows you. He knows everything about you. He wants and desires an intimate relationship with you. David had an intimate relationship with the Lord. That's why he said the Lord is my shepherd. He's not just saying the Lord is a shepherd. He said the Lord is my shepherd. This morning, I'm guessing that not many of you have experience in herding sheep. Any sheep herders here? Okay, I don't see a single hand. But here's the deal. You may, not, you may not have heard a sheep, but you're pretty close to getting the idea of knowing what it's like as a parent. Kind of similar. As a parent, you know that your children are, are a lot alike in so many ways. They, they all have your love. That's one thing they have in common. They're all wretched little stinking sinners. <laughs> that, they're, that, that's... That's it. Eli, that was supposed to be funny. (laughs) I was talking about you. (laughs) It was a joke. (laughs) He's just looking at me like, what are you talking about? But they're also uniquely different. And, you know, you can correct one child with with just a look. And... The next child, a look, does nothing. (laughs) Absolutely doesn't even phase them. You could put a machete in the hand of one child and feel totally safe. (laughs) You could put a stick of butter in the hand of another one. You're worried to death what's going to happen with that stick of butter. Some, some, some are tender, some are, are stubborn, some, some are easily hurt, some you can't, you can't hurt them at all. They don't get hurt. All of this knowledge goes into allowing you to be a better parent. The same way a sheep, a shepherd knows their sheep, and Jesus says, he's the good shepherd. He's a good shepherd who knows his sheep and he knows them intimately. There's, there's nothing about you that he doesn't know. He knows, he knows it all. He knows your secrets. He knows your needs. He knows your tendencies. He knows your desires, your hopes, your flaws, your failings, your sins. He knows all of that. The reality is he knows, and Scripture tells us, that he knows us better than we know ourselves. And the reality is is that he loves us more than we could ever comprehend. Aren't you thankful for that? Because you know you, right? And there's a lot that you won't let anybody else know. But he knows all of that. And yet we have the promise of his love. David said in Psalm 139, O Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see when when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it. 
You go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. So as a good shepherd, Jesus showed what links that he would go to for the eternal protection of his sheep. He's the good shepherd and he protects with his very life. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for sheep. Jesus talks about the hired hands. And he said the hired hand doesn't, doesn't have the same relationship with the sheep. You see, a good shepherd might have about 500 to 1,000 sheep in his flock. Any more than that, and he's gonna have to hire someone to help him. But then you realize that these, these sheep herders, are, uh, they're on the clock all the time. You know, because if, if, uh, if he goes to sleep, what happens to the sheep? They, they wander off. And so to help him, because he can't 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year, watch these sheep, he's gonna hire someone to help him. And this is what Jesus said about the hired hand, verse 12. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep, but he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. So this hired hand, he's not invested and is the first sign of, of trouble and he's out of there. But Jesus said, this is my commitment, that I'll die. And he showed that commitment by dying for his sheep. He knows his sheep, he knows you and he loves you. The good shepherd also protects his sheep. We see this in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Um, David uh, was trying to convince King Saul that he, he alone could go out and take on Goliath the Philistine, the giant. And um, Saul said to him, verse 33, 1 Samuel 17, he says, don't be ridiculous, he says to David. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man, a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. He said, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Now that's a good resume, isn't it? To go kill a, kill a giant. You laugh about that, but this is what he says. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to the mouth of, to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. That's a good shepherd. One that in the face of adversity, he goes and captures him by the, by the jaw and clubs him to death. It's a good shepherd. He's taking care of his sheep. And he's saying, look, I can take this guy. He's no problem. I want you to think through this. If, if a shepherd dies, the flock is abandoned to whatever. There's nothing left to protect them. It's not a good thing if a shepherd dies. But Jesus, being the good shepherd, knew that if he didn't die, his flock would be abandoned to the darkness. He dies so that we can live. That's a good shepherd. He knew what we needed and his willingness to meet that need led him to his death it wasn't an accidental death. He said, I lay down my life. Nobody took it. He laid down his life for his sheep. He's a protector, and he's able to do that. And the third thing is that he's a provider. The good shepherd is a provider for his sheep. 
I want you to think for a minute about the last verse, Psalm 23. You might be familiar with Psalm 23. I read some of it earlier. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I don't want for anything. But the last verse of, of that chapter, the context being the Lord is our shepherd, the final statement begins with this. Surely goodness and mercy, or surely goodness and love, however, what version you know it, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Surely, meaning it is absolutely guaranteed. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. He provides goodness and blessing and forgiveness and love and mercy and the all of his sheep have that in their possession all the days of their life. Goodness and love follow us. A better, a better interpretation of that is they are pursuing us. God's goodness, his mercy, and his love are pursuing us, and there's no way that we could shake it off. It's kind of like a shadow that we can't get away from nor would we ever want to get away from it. But that's his promise to us, is that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. I want to ask you these question, this question. Do you think that God knows what you need? How many of you think that God knows exactly what you need today? Okay, I'm looking around and I see most every hand raised. Is that, is that correct? How many of you think God knows exactly what I need? How many of you think of those people that God can provide whatever I have need of? God can make it happen. Just raise your hand if you think that's true. Okay? If that's the case that we, we believe that God knows exactly what we need and that he can make that happen, why do we worry? Why do we worry about these things? You see, Really what our worry says is, God, I don't think that you can handle this. God, I don't know that you have a plan here. I mean, here's what our faith says. Our faith says, God knows exactly what I have need of. Where did we learn that? It says it in Scripture over and over. And it also talks about how he can provide everything that we have need of. So my question is, why do we worry about those things? We either believe that God is able to provide or he can't. You realize that there's no middle ground? Faith says, God, you, you can supply it for me. If I don't believe that, then I'm not believing his word. Is that harsh? Is that direct? Does that step on any toes? We worry about a lot of things that are in God's, God's hand and his control. Either we believe that he can do it or we don't. Jesus said this about worry, Matthew chapter six. He said, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable than they are? Call your, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make, make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers, that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. There is a condition there. Okay, we can't just say God's gonna, God's gonna give me everything. Seek first the kingdom of God and live righteous lives and all these other things will be added to us. Are we seeking God? Are we looking to him? Is our faith in him? Do we believe him? 
And if we do, then we have no, there should be no room for us to worry about any of that. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Let's trust God with our lives and with our stuff, with our circumstances, that he can and will provide what we have need of. How many of you have a need today? And I'm just serious. There's something in your life that you have need of. Just raise your hand. I mean, there's circumstances, there's situations out there. You don't know how it's going to work out. Okay, let's ask the question. Does God know what you have need of? Can God and will God provide what you have need of? Let's take it to him and give it to him. Would you stand with me this morning? Throughout scripture, Paul says, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Tell God what you need. God will supply all of our needs according to his riches. God is able through his spirit at work in us to do infinitely more than we could ever imagine. This is our God. He provided for you time and time and time again. We have a room filled with people here who have faith in God. And you look back over your life, if you look back over the landscape of your life, there are stones that have been set in place where God met your needs where God delivered you, where God provided, where God healed. God has done so many things. You look back over your life and you look back over your family and your friend's life and you see God doing amazing things. Why, why can't he do it now? Why would we worry that he took care of us then but he can't take care of us now? He's a shepherd and he cares for you. He loves you, he's for you, he has everything that you have need of. You just need to bring yourself to him, look to him, call on him. Live righteous lives before him and trust that he's going to take care of you. Would you bow your heads with me? This morning, if you need God, you need a relationship with him. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another minute. He's the shepherd. He laid down his life for you. Give your life to him. How many of you today would say, I'm giving my life to Jesus? I'm not there, but I want to give my life to him. Just raise your hand and keep it raised. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else looking around? Today, I know many of you raise your hand that you have needs, and here's what I want us to do. As we sing, I want you to come and find a place here, and let's offer ourselves to the Lord. Our shepherd, we're his sheep. We need a shepherd. We're prone to wander. Let's bring our lives to him. If you have a need today, I believe that God is going to meet needs right here. And don't think it's too small or too insignificant. Let's come to our shepherd and offer ourselves to him.